This is Kalani Cast, episode 40. Today we're joined by Emma Browning, who is a senior research associate for the Texas a and Natural Resources Institute. Uh, Emma did her master's thesis at University of Georgia at the Savannah River Ecology Laboratory, looking at translocation of box turtles, the efficacy of that, and has worked with turtles in other capacities. So we're really excited to talk to her today. Thanks for coming on, Emma. Thanks for having me. All right, Wyatt, do you want to get us started? Yeah, so uh, Emma, what got you into turtles? Yeah, so I grew up on a ranch in Texas, so I was always outdoors, always um, looking for all kinds of wildlife. And um, what really got me interested in turtles was the fact uh, that my hometown, we lived like four miles outside of my hometown with like 300 people, but they would have turtle races every year, which back then in the 90s, we didn't know they were bad, but we would catch a turtle and they'd bring it to the town square. And they basically, what they'd do is draw these huge bullseyes. And then you'd put your turtle that you brought on the outskirts of the bullseye and whatever turtle made it to the center won the turtle race and you got prizes, whatever. So we're always very excited to put a turtle in the race. So I think I was around five, um, we found a little ornate box turtle because um, that's what we have there in Texas. And we gave her food and water and put her in a box, like a cardboard box, and put her on the porch overnight um, for the race the next day. Well, the next morning we woke up and she had chewed her way out of the cardboard box and just uh, booked it. And I was really, as a kid, I was really disappointed. I didn't have a turtle. Um, you know, looking back now, I'm like, thank goodness. <laughs> um, but, you know, that same turtle actually came back the next year and we could recognize her because we put a little bit of paint on her shell, not a lot, uh, which you shouldn't do, obviously, but we didn't know any better. And uh, so we gave her food and so, like food from the garden and water. And then she came back for the next 15 years. She would actually wait by our back door and wait for one of us to come out. And this was maybe a week out of the summer that she would do this and We'd give her a little bit of water and food from the garden. So um, it was really cool to have like this childhood pet that wasn't really a pet, like this wild turtle. It really showed how uh, um, smart reptiles are. Um, so yeah, that was probably my first, uh, what sparked my interest in turtles was this little turtle we had. That, that's actually really interesting. So it, it was it was a wild animal. That it, was it a slider or what type of... Uh... It was an ornate box turtle. Oh, but okay, mm -hmm. box turtle. And okay, so it would come back like pretty seasonally, regularly for food. Yeah, <laughs> that's really interesting. <laughs> cool, yep. kind of cool fidelity. I've, I'm out in uh, California right now doing pond turtle surveys for oh, cool. projects I'm doing. I, I I don't know, like it's not something that was coming back to my house or whatever, but I've seen individual turtles in the same place for like months on end. So it's kind mm -hmm. of a similar thing. Uh, yeah, but that kind sure. of like year long is that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, so okay, so that's cool. I, I know you've done a lot of work like in your, your master's work, um, with turtles, but before that, uh, at undergrad, uh, I'm did you do a lot of turtle work or reptile work in undergrad or? <laughs> So in undergrad, I really, um, that was like my first taste of field work. Uh, so I would uh, go on optional field trips uh, during classes. So uh, like herpetology would have field trips and they actually had these partnerships with state parks where students from the university would go and um, learn how to trap for reptiles and amphibians. So that was really my first dose of field work and um, being able to like use different methods to trap turtles. So we did a lot of aquatic sampling uh, for turtles and uh, we did baseline inventories for Caddo uh, Lake State Park. And I think Gus Engling was another one. Um, so there was a lot of opportunities like that through undergrad, but it was more really on a volunteer basis, if that makes sense. Yeah, right, right. That that makes sense. Um, it, it, yeah, that's interesting. Going around it, it, and doing like assemblage studies or like marker capture. Mm -hmm. That's okay. And then, so I know you did some work at uh, Eglin Air Force Base in the Panhandle region of Florida. Uh, that that's a cool area. I, I've spent a little bit of time, sort of recently there. I got uh, my first ticket in that area because it's just loaded with uh cops all over the place but yeah. it's cool 
turtle wise, the panhandle's great. I'm, uh, what kind of work were you doing at Eglin Air Force Base? And so, um, I first uh, got into Eglin because I was on the uh, uh, project uh, working to assess the population of uh, reticulated flatwood salamanders. So I worked on a drip fence there. Um, so that was the first job I had. And then this uh, during the summer when it wasn't really salamander season, I would uh, do gopher tortoise work. And um, what uh, that entailed was, uh, so Eglin is taking on uh, gopher tortoises uh, from southern Florida because of all the development. There's basically a program where they can take the tortoise and relocate it to Eglin. So I helped on the receiving end of that. Uh, I helped like process the tortoises as they came in from South Florida. Um, so we checked to see if they were healthy um, and then give them uh, unique IDs. And then we would put them out into these huge soft release pins on Eglin. And that was really what I did with gopher tortoises there. Um, I did a little bit of red cockaded woodpecker work, um, but salamanders and tortoises were my big, uh, big thing I worked on. That's, that's interesting. So it, it's the, uh, cause the Florida has the regulation where it, was it for development areas? They were the move tortoises. That's where they're coming from. Yeah. Mo most of them come from South Florida. So Eglin has received like thousands of tortoises. So their, um, their populations are looking pretty good right now uh, because of that. Okay. That, but it's sort of an admixture. That, that's something curious. Were you looking at the social hierarchy there or anything? I mean, it, when you mix a lot of tortoises in different places, I mean, they definitely have some of the work, uh, not at SREL, but are in around that region. They've looked at social networks of tortoises. Uh, there's definitely a pretty complicated social structure there. Is that something you looked at at Eglin? No, that's uh, not anything that we looked at. Uh, really, I was there to like process the tortoise and then take it out into the pen. Um, you would see some interesting social behaviors like head bobbing when two males saw each other or, uh, you know, they'll use each other's burrows. Um, but uh, we didn't really look into that, uh, like the behavioral part of it. There might be others that are, but um, I wasn't part of that. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. It, were, did you see any, just sort of like observation wise, uh, the, the gopher tortoises are known for the commensalism with other species. Where, are there any instances where you saw something kind of interesting living in a tortoise burrow or? Um, yeah. So um, actually we had a few projects looking at commensals. So we had set up uh, game camera traps at, uh, at the burrow to see uh, what was using them as well. And so we would have to look out like through thousands of photos to see something, but you would get all kinds of commensals. Um, I also, uh, something else we used were uh, uh, scopes. So it's like this camera on a long cable attached to a monitor and you just push it down the burrow to see if the tortoise is there. And I, I've found like Eastern diamondback rattlesnakes that way, um, corn snakes, uh, scope frogs. So, uh, it, it's been, it was really cool to see that all the commensals using those burrows. Yeah, that's really interesting. That That's fascinating to me. Like, it's tough to justify for a lot of turtles why the research is necessary, because it always has to come back to humans in some way right. for <laughs> most people, right? Yeah. But when you can say that that's something that they're doing and they're helping 400 other species, and then you can use what those species do is justification for it. That's really something that's that's powerful uh, in terms of a management perspective. I think so. It's cool that you were getting data on that. And yeah, definitely. That. <laughs> yeah. So uh, being in the Panhandle, I, I, I this summer even I've I've spent time there. But turtle wise, it's really interesting. And almost every species of turtle there has something unique about it. Like you've got weird eastern box turtles. The sliders are all intergrades. Every, everything's sort of different there. Uh, curious if you did some beyond what you were doing at, at Eglin, uh, if you just went around and looked for stuff, if you found anything interesting or notable turtle-wise. Yeah, so um, I would road cruise all the time outside of work <laughs> because I lived right, you know, right at Eglin. So there's a lot of good dirt roads to road cruise. And uh, I think one of the most memorable experiences is when I road cruised um, freshly hatched 
uh, Florida soft shells. Um, their eggs had been in the dirt. It was a loose sandy road. And unfortunately some had been run over, but I found them a, a lot in time and I was able to put them over in a wetland. And that was really cool to see. Uh, I'd never seen them that little. And it was cool to take them over to that wetland and just watch them like naturally burrow into the marsh. Um, so that was a really cool, uh, one of the best finds I've had uh, turtle wise in Florida. <laughs> That's really cool. I've I've never seen hatchling soft shells or anything. I've seen sea turtle hatchlings, but that that's real interesting. That's uh, when I was in the Panhandle out there, we found smooth soft shells in the Kaneka, and seeing okay. the the adults, I got a video of one. You put them down. I mean, they disappear within five seconds. It's yep. insane. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah, fast. Yeah, you know why they're so, but the, the hatchlings must do it real quick because they're just so small. It's just a flick and they're <laughs> gone. Yeah, it was like that's seconds. Cool. <laughs> that's cool. You got to see that. Uh, okay, so I I, I think uh, it makes sense. Like, I, maybe I'm wrong, but the the uh, sort of inspiration for your master thesis with the box turtles came from that work, I would assume. Yeah, so um, it. It was what I did in Florida that inspired me, but also um, I've kind of worked on other projects that were related to movement, um, like wildlife movement. Um, so like I worked in Michigan on a, a, a base there where I tracked Eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes. And then I, uh, we also had a study while I was in Eglin um, that we had to put transmitters on gopher tortoises. So. Um, that really sparked my interest in, yeah, wildlife movement. Uh, and then I also have uh, tracked uh, indigo snakes as well. Um, so that was definitely uh, sparked my interest and kind of let me know what I wanted to like look into with research. Okay. It, so you, you were, you were also putting transmitters at Eglin on the gopher tortoises. That was kind of the main work with, with going back to that real quick. I, we, I didn't really address that, but what were you finding with how the tortoises are moving around there? You know, I can't really remember because that was, I was a technician on the grad students project, but we were okay. looking at movement patterns between tortoises uh, that were in like more natural uh, habitat compared to those on like a, a bombing range kind of thing. So that's what we were looking at. I, I don't remember what the results were exactly. Um, but he's graduated, so it's probably uh, in his thesis somewhere, <laughs> if you knew that That's fair. <laughs> yeah, like you said, you were out there doing the field work. And, that's, uh, and then, okay, so going to your, your master's thesis with box turtles, which was, that was sort of, you were responsible for all that, the analysis, everything part of that. Mm -hmm. um, I, so you were working with confiscated turtles that were relocated back to the Savannah River Ecology Lab. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of curious, like that's sort of the ultimate goal. That's full circle, uh, but it doesn't happen that frequently. So how, how did that get arranged, the just re, re, the reintroduction? Yeah, so it um, that whole project kind of started before I was hired. Um, so basically, South Carolina DNR, um, they uh, confiscated over 200 Eastern box turtles that were illegally collected from the wild. So all of these box turtles were then brought to the Savannah River Ecology Laboratory um, to give them some time to recover because they were found in really poor conditions and also to give, uh, to uh, kind of figure out what to do with them. So as a result, uh, University of Georgia's uh, Savannah River Ecology Laboratory um, U.S. Forest Service on the Savannah River site, and then South Carolina DNR came together to forge this partnership, um, and their goal was to put these animals back out into the wild. So that's whenever I came in as a grad student to kind of, um, kind of form these questions that we wanted to look into. Um, so that was basically the, the origin of the project. Right, right. So And then, so you wanted to know so you had some wild turtles and confiscated turtles, and it was a similar idea with soft release pens. And may maybe you can just give a rundown of what the, the project sort of design was, or maybe the process of getting to that design, because you said you had to come up with the question. Like, what, what kind of iterations did you go through in terms of question? How did you settle on, on what you actually analyzed? 
Well, um, the important thing, so there's not a lot of data out there when it comes to confiscated turtles and like post-release uh, movement data. There, there's nothing out there. And so uh, we were really curious about um, after, you know, being released into a new area, how would they do? Um, how far would they move? Because um, a lot of times when you translocate a, a turtle or tortoise, uh, like a hard release, they'll just book it. They'll keep, they'll have these really big movement patterns, really big home ranges. So we wanted to see if the soft release pin would help with that. Um, and then, yeah, we want to see how long it would take them to settle and how large their home ranges would be compared to those of the resident box turtles. So the, the residents were actually added onto the study um, after we released my box turtles uh, from the pin. Uh, they were held there for about seven months in this soft release pen. Okay. It, so, okay. So they were also soft. So the, the you had two sets of cohorts of soft release turtles so and you wanted to compare. Yeah. So it was like the confiscated turtles were soft release. And then I just found these resident turtles as I was tracking my confiscated turtles. And then we added 10 to the study to serve as the control. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Right. That's, that's an interesting. So they were found. So you'd already done the soft release for the, the confiscated turtles. And yes. then a year, there's some amount of time later did it with wild turtles. And it, okay, or, that, so we did it at the same time. If that makes okay. sense. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah. you were right. Okay. that Okay. So that would make sense. You don't want to confound it with a time effect. That's sort yeah. Of thing. So we, yeah. So we released these confiscated turtles from the pen. And then as I was tracking them, I collected 10 resident box turtles. I released my confiscated turtles in May and I found resident turtles from about May to June is when I add, that's the timeline. I added them to the study because we didn't want to get too far out. We wanted it really comparable with timelines. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Did, did you have uh, genetic data with any with the, the confiscated animals? Like, did you know they were from there or? No, so that is something we just didn't have that information, but we are working with an organization. So we did collect genetic samples. So we are working with an organization who is making the bank Eastern box turtles across uh, the populations across the U.S. So that is in the works now, um, and that'll be helpful for future confiscations. We're hoping that it allows for when you get a confiscation, you can get genetic samples and then know where they came from. But unfortunately, we didn't have that information uh, for our turtles. Okay. Yeah. So that's something forthcoming or, yeah. or in the works. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. So you want to know, so that was kind of the, the, the study design. Uh, but then you track the movement of the turtles after a set period of time, What nine months or seven months, you said? Uh, uh, well, uh, they were in the soft release pen for seven months to allow them to acclimate, uh, but then I tracked them for two years after that. Okay, so that's where sort of the, the meat of the study was in terms mm -hmm. of figuring out uh, what was going on. Um, and I, I, Sort of before we get into what you found, uh, why is it important to know this in terms of how turtles are moving? What's sort of the conservation implications for that? So, um, so basically, when you have a confiscation, the International Union for Conservation of Nature gives you three options. You have euthanasia, you have being placed in a facility uh, for the rest of the turtle or tortoise's life, or you have uh, returning that animal back into the wild. Um, the latter is often recommended as last resort. About only 6% of turtles are released back into the wild uh, from a confiscation. And so um, because of that, there's not a lot of data. And when you think about it, uh, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of turtles and tortoises are poached and uh, in the wildlife trade. And so if you're only returning like 6%, um, you know, that's not a lot of turtles to go back out in the wild. So we need to find a solution, you know, to put these animals or make guidelines to put these animals back out in the wild or they're going to vanish. So this is why the study is so important because it kind of serves, uh, we want it to serve as a guideline for future confiscations. Um, so people can kind of make decisions and hopefully returning these animals to the wild will 
be a more popular option, if that makes sense. Yeah, right. uh, Another thing that that brings up, because this is one thing we're talking to people to keep turtles, tortoises in captivity. It gets kind of interesting. So confiscated animals is sort of not, there's no net positive, no no net gain there because you're essentially putting something back that you know was taken. But a lot of people in captivity, they work with captive breeding and they're producing more offspring. Box turtles can be fairly common, but they've been depleted from habitat alteration, that sort of thing, and and other anthropogenic issues in certain areas. Is there any uh, potential move to not only do confiscated animals, but to take captive born offspring and put them back? Uh, w- would that also be an alternative? I think it could be. Um, I think there's definitely other organizations that are probably working on things like that. Um, you know, it would be the question of um, how are ca- captive born animals going to do in the wild? So you'd probably have to have like a few pilot studies to kind of check in about that. But I'm, I think it's feasible um, for sure. Right. It's just sort of a different, it, it's probably more of a location specific thing. If it's an area that's been depleted over time, then put new ones back. You don't need to know that they they were poached and, and they have to be put back to get that, get back to equilibrium, I guess, there. Right. <laughs> but, uh, all right. So, so, okay. So you released the turtles. They were held for a period of time. And that, that the logic behind that is it sort of establishes more of a range for them and they, they get to know the area better. Is it that's that's the right way to think about that? Yeah. So there's been previous studies where um, gopher tortoises uh, were uh, uh, put in these soft release pens, and the longer period of time that they were in these pens, they were more likely to um, kind of stay in the same place and not really move a whole lot. So um, that's where we had the idea: is if you know other turtles can or tortoises can do this, maybe it can be possible in our box turtles. Of course, we can't really say if it did anything because we didn't do like uh, a set that were hard release. So we can't compare them in that way. Um, But there is someone uh, who's doing a follow-up study in my lab uh, that did hard release versus um, soft release with rehab turtles that were uh, released back into the wild. Um, So there's a follow-up with that, but my study didn't do that, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, so that that's cool. That, that it's sort of a, and you were mentioning earlier, it's it's sort of a lab wide thing. So when you were coming in with this, you probably approach this from different angles, and uh, different people take different parts of the whole question, which is sort of just it, turtles coming back in. What's the best way to manage them? And you have to separate that out into different questions. And it's not like one person couldn't do all of that. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's a cool example though where the the whole team collaboration comes into play. Uh, so okay, so you released the turtles and were, you tracked them for two years. Mm-hmm. Uh, bef- so when you were tracking them, that the SREL is sort of a uh, like a legendary place for a lot of people because of how hard it is to get on. Like you have to have all of the permitting to get on to the the location. So most people know about it, but they haven't really seen it. But you've seen it and have experience there. I'm curious, what what was it like working out there? Yeah, so um, first of all, the lab was really cool. Um, You know, it's full of like, uh, SRL is full of like fellow grad students and advisors that really support your career. So it's a really cool atmosphere to be a part of because everyone's passionate. And then of course, it's located on the Savannah River site, which is like 310 square miles or around that. And yeah, the habitat, I mean, there's, uh, longleaf pine there's um uh like there's swamps in like uh, carolina bays it's uh i actually got to go out in a carolina bay um and go herping out there one night um so it was uh really cool not to just do field work but also volunteer for other other things as well while i was out there but it was there's so many uh different uh habitats it was really cool to be able to see that and experience it Right. Beyond turtle, sort of diverging for a second. Uh, beyond turtles, what kind of stuff did you do out there? I'm curious. Like, you know, I um, I mostly did turtle work. Okay. Um, yeah, there was one time because uh, I 
uh, tracking turtle sticks is very time consuming. So it's, I was mostly working on my project, but there was a time where I got to go out in a little uh, canoe and uh, try and track some alligators. So that was kind of fun. Um, and then, uh, and then just general herping out there, uh, going out with a lab and herping that, that was fun. Um, so, but it was mostly focused. I did, I did a little bit of gopher tortoise work. Um, I did some egg searching with my lab. Um, and so that was pretty cool uh, to dig for eggs because our, our lab, uh, uh, hatches out gopher tortoises. Um, so anyway, uh, so I got to help a little bit on that as well. I forgot about that, but it was fun. <laughs> that's, that's cool. Just all the different experiences out there and seeing life, like reading through, uh, Wig Gibbons slider book. He, he gives a, a really good detailed description of the habitat. And it just you like the Carolina Bays, all the different ponds like Par Pond and some of the other the 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 bay ponds. That it's 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 it sounds like a cool place. I'm yet to go, but it, it's uh, awesome. <laughs> Hopefully you can yeah. make it out there one day. Oh, I'll, I'll get out there at some point. But yeah, just a matter of time. Got to have the, the amount of time to do it. That's the biggest issue. So sure. with the box turtles, um, your hypothesis then is that the soft release, well, I guess you weren't comparing it yet to just hard release turtles, but you would assume that compared to the, the soft release wild turtles, the soft release confiscated turtles would have a similar home range or it, it, that's sort of what you went into assuming. Is that right? Well, um, so we were comparing movement patterns between uh, residents that were already on base um, and uh or already on the Savannah River site, and then of course the confiscated turtles. So our thought was that even though we did put them in a soft release pen, we weren't sure how long we needed to do it or if it was going to help. So we assumed that our confiscated turtles would have much larger home ranges as they were trying to find and acclimate to where they were compared to uh, resident turtles we thought would have smaller home ranges. So that's what we were doing, which is comparing those movement patterns to our control of the resident turtles on the site. And I do want to mention when we collected those residents to put transmitters on them, we put them back where we found them. So it was like they got to continue their everyday activities, if that makes sense. So they weren't soft released or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. So you just want to see. Yeah. So what kind of methods, there's a lot of different, there's even some papers of debating the different types of methods for calculating home range, that sort of thing. So were you doing linear distances or how, how did you calculate uh, the, the range of the turtles? What, how did you get that, that, that distance metric? Yeah, so um, so I was out there collecting GPS points for two years. So we used all that locality data to um, kind of calculate different metrics like cumulative distance, how long did they move in one year? And then of course, uh, we used um, uh, minimum convex polygons for home range. Um, so I'm not sure if you're familiar, but it's basically, it draws a line around that outermost GPS points where the turtle was, and that kind of uh, makes an estimate of how big that area is. And that's a method that we use because most um, most papers you see use MCPs. And so we just want to be able to compare to other papers if needed. Um, so that's really the method that I used was um, uh, seeing how big the home ranges were. I also looked into how long it took them to settle and then how far away they were from uh, from like where we released them into where they settled. So that, that was kind of the metrics I was looking at. Okay, right. And, and so what, what did you end up, after analyzing all the data, what, what did you end up finding? Uh, what were sort of the major conclusions? Yeah, so we found that in the first year, because we did this for two, we found that in the first year, uh, our confiscated turtles, if you don't exclude the settling phase, they had a much larger home range than resident turtles. But if you kind of make that settling phase into its own thing, and then you only make a home range afterwards, um, they their home ranges were comparable. Um, and then that second year, um, their home ranges were about the same. So over time, uh, from being like moving around and figuring out where they were, their home ranges became like a normal box turtle on site. That's That's 
promising. It seems like it's good to know. That's it's sort of encouraging for sure. <laughs> yeah. It, were there any, uh, so one of the things like just with turtles in general, I, I'm curious with this. A lot of people are, is like individual response. Uh, did you see a lot of, was it something that uh, it, it's like taking means and, and averages and such is good for, it makes things efficient, but it's not necessarily realistic when you talk about individual turtles. So did you see a lot of individual differences or was it a pretty consistent uh, change? It was a, a majority of the turtles. It was a pretty consistent change, but you do have a few of those outliers. So uh, for example, uh, in the second year, we had one turtle um, that didn't establish a home range because he just, after he woke up from dormancy, he just jetted and moved like a kilometer randomly. So you have like, um, so a majority did kind of show the same pattern, but you did have a few of those outliers that um, traveled around a bit. Okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's sort of like, uh, I, I've done some work with desert tortoises. It's, there's a lot of studies that are similar to this with desert tortoises that have been done. And it's like there's always one turtle in those studies that's just a crazy transient. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I think there was some there was one where it, it traversed multiple mountain ranges over the course of a few years. Just like, oh ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so in terms of because you're out there doing telemetry work, which is it's fun stuff and, and you're seeing a lot of different things like you've how easy is it to find box turtles with the telemeter? Um, you know, it depends on the habitat um, because, you know, if you're in a really swampy area that that signal will bounce. Um, so but if you're in a nice upland area where like you're you're on a hill um it's really easy to get a signal so it just depends on that habitat but it, i found that like going into this i didn't have a lot of experience with box turtles i didn't realize how um how much they loved uh being in like the like the floodplains um i actually had a few turtles cross a sizable creek I didn't realize they could swim. I doubt it's very graceful, but I had several crisscross across this creek. So um, it, it that definitely made them hard to try. They definitely gave me a run for my money. Um, I oh. wasn't expecting them to uh, do what they did. <laughs> That's interesting. It's like uh, Gulf Coast, they, like Eastern box turtles. That, that I've heard of that kind of thing, but the fact that they were crossing creeks is pretty interesting. Yeah. I, I know Gulf. Yeah, Gulf Coast will like go like 10 feet down, that kind of thing. But I thought they were sort of unique in doing that. Yeah, um, no, I also found uh, box turtles completely like submerged in puddles. Like they they loved it uh, in mud. Um, so I was not expecting that. So that, yeah, can definitely make tracking them kind of uh, difficult. <laughs> yeah, box turtles are definitely more aquatic than people give them credit for. Mm -hmm. I mean. They're not as aquatic as most other amidids, but I live on the, I live in Delaware, which is a peninsula. And um, there's this, I live on a bird preserve pretty much um, called Thompson's Island. And the, there's two main islands uh, that make up the state park. And there's one that's way out in the, in the bay. It's probably, pretty much, it's probably like a hundred feet uh, through marsh that you have to get to it. And there are box turtles that I found all the way out there that have had to go back <laughs> Forth between the marsh so they definitely travel uh, yeah i believe it now <laughs> yeah I, yeah i, I mean it i i've got uh i'm getting more experience with them although this year's been sort of tough to find them and i i live in atlanta now it's tough to find them there but i'm more uh I'm more of a western pond turtle person but that's that's interesting that you were seeing them like it that's very aquatic mm -hmm. it's like submerge that i'm also curious about something something that's notable about the srel is that it's i i know i'm sh i don't know the current state of this but i assume it hasn't changed much is it's radioactive in some of the ponds i don't know for the confiscated turtles i'm assuming they weren't radioactive yet but with the wild turtles was that something you measured no um you know it wasn't but uh, I was, my study was conducted on a, like a research set aside. So it was a piece of land set aside just for like conservation. So I wasn't in any of those places. Um, oh. 
So yeah. <laughs> We actually that okay. uh, briefly on the Whit Gibbons episode. So, yeah. Did you say sorry? We actually covered that uh, briefly in the Whit Gibbons episode about radioactive sliders on the Savannah River. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> yeah, he, he they analyzed. I, so you were kind of far away from it. I, I mean, it, it sort of leeches a good deal, but it, who knows? I mean, it, it hopefully not. Hopefully they, they weren't. Uh, but that was a whole, I mean, he's got a, a chapter in, in the slider book dedicated to it. It's like, there were some ridiculously radioactive yeah. sliders. It's so I, cool. It's, it's so cool. Yeah. That's amazing. It, it, it's real interesting because they can use that, like the decay rates and, and, and you can use the, uh, like equations to figure out like assimilation rates for the diet and such, but it, it's like a, it's a useful analyte for for ecology which but but that's not that wasn't pertaining to your work but i was just figured it might be interesting if you measured that to see are the radioactive turtles moving more or what like, i'm sure but, you could but yeah we definitely didn't we didn't do that i didn't think about that <laughs> yeah so it, what were some of the uh the telemetry can also be kind of challenging I, i've done some with desert tortoises in, in the west coast um were there any particular like, challenges to doing it? Like just was going out there consistently just, was that part tough or were there any things that you didn't expect that was tough about it? Yeah. So I think what I didn't expect were my turtles to move so much. Um, I mean, they, as soon as we opened the pen, some of them just booked it a lot uh, so much that I lost a signal on a few. I mean, I found them, but they had traveled that far and, um, so it's really how much they moved. Uh, some of the habitat, like I said, when they crossed that creek, um, they got into some pretty uh, nasty habitat doing that. And I had to find another way to get to them. So I had to find old forestry roads to uh, pick up a signal again, because I had to kind of guess where they would go, think like a turtle and be like, well, I think they would go this way. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was one of the most challenging things was uh, probably, uh, I mean, it's kind of fun, though, because when you find them, you're like, ah, I knew it. I'm mean, such a great, like, biologist, whatever. But um, <laughs> yeah, it was challenging to also, like, just get through the habitat because th there was a part of it where if you took – I memorized a path, and I had it saved on my GPS because if you took one step away from the path, like, you would be in walls of, like, the devil's walking stick. It was, like, awful. Um so yeah, some of the habitat could be really difficult. So, um, so yeah. <laughs> well, I, I don't think we actually talked about like, what was the average home range size uh, for confiscated versus wild turtles? Just yeah. like what kind, of, what kind of distance are we talking about? So distance, so settling distance for, so when they were released from the pen, uh, Males had an average of like uh, 400 meters of before they settled, while females had an average of like 800 meters before they settled. Um, but I, I did have a, a female that um, she was almost, I believe, two kilometers away from the pen. Um, so she had moved across the whole site. And I mean, and I also had a few move uh, across like really bad tornado damage too, but, um, but yeah, that, that was the average, but there was an outlier that moved almost two kilometers. That's interesting. So, so females that, so settling distance was a different metric than home range. Yeah. So it was from the release pen all the way to where they had settled. Mm -hmm. That That's real interesting. That adds kind of a different dimension to it. Did, was there any, environmental variables you saw that were consistently associated with where they would settle like when they hit something in particular i i noticed that most of them settled in like uh, uh floodplains uh i had a few because the pin that we had them in was uh in a two and a half acre uh like hardwood forest with bluffs and i noticed that most of my turtles moved into the floodplains so that's really uh seemed like their ideal place to stay which totally makes sense now um knowing they're a little more aquatic than i thought yeah it why why do you think females like 
I, I believe the literature with like home range from males is typically a bit larger. I, it's super dependent on species and, and area. But why were the females? So the female settling distance was longer. But was that the same with the home range over time for females? Or why do you think that they had longer settling range? So part of the larger movement patterns could be due to um, them traveling whenever they nest because some of them were way down in these wetlands and they wanted to go up to the uplands uh, in sandy soil to lay their eggs. So when I, I had a female, it was a resident, but I had a female that uh, moved over 500 meters to just go to this place to nest. Um, so I think that kind of explains some of maybe the larger movements. Um, also probably depends on the individual too, but, um, but yeah, that, that's what I was reading in literature, that it was uh, nesting behavior. Like they're trying, they're seeking out more specific habitats for the nesting in particular. Yes. Yeah. That makes, did you get to see any, uh, like reproductive behaviors with, uh, like. Yeah. Um, so actually, so we decided to add residents to the study to serve a control. So the first one I found was um, uh, they were basically, it, I had a little female I just tracked to this little wetland area and there was a male and they were just touching nose to nose, just checking each other out. Um, and then I ran into several mating with my confiscated turtles that weren't part of the study. Um, and that's something to add. We also would collect GPS points of all, like I found probably around 50 residents during my time just tracking my own box turtles. So we had always collect data from them, take them to the lab, just get samples. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, I found a lot of them mating with each other. Uh, it was it, I, I found way more than I expected uh, that way. <laughs> I think Wyatt and Jack is usually on here. They find a lot of box. Do you, do you guys see a lot of mating activity? Oh, yeah. Whenever we go out, um, when it's that time of the year, there's one spot in particular. There's a little – it's at the same uh, preserve I was just talking about, the Thompson's Island State Park. There is this little water hole, and we find them all the time mating. Like, full on, we'll watch the whole entire courtship episode just play out, and it's awesome. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, we've recorded, it, we've recorded it a couple of times. It's pretty well documented between Jack and I. Um, you know, it's just something that's really cool to see. Um, oh, for sure. And we get some really beautiful individuals out of that spot, too. And it's always best to look for them right after it rains because yep. one, they're out looking for worms, and two, they're wet, so their colors are just so much more vibrant. Yeah, no, I definitely, anytime I go out and it was raining, my box turtles would just be yep. looking at it somewhere. So, yeah, uh, I noticed that too. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a lot of correlation between those things. <laughs> so something that was sort of interesting from a uh, – uh, Dr. Ken Dodd's box turtle, North American box turtle book. He mentions, I can't remember if this was just in reference to Florida box turtles, but I think it was sort of universal that box turtles in the morning, they, they prefer like edge habitats. And then there you go. And, <laughs> and then they move into more denser canopy when it gets hotter. Were you seeing a lot or were they mostly just always in the floodplain or were they moving between habitats depending on the time of day? Um, I think they were moving habitats depending on the time of the day uh, because I did have, I remember one male, I would find them uh, in the morning up on these like ravine bluffs. And then in the if I tracked him at a different time of the day, um, he was kind of soaking. So it, it makes total sense. You know, they'll, they'll move around and if they're hot, you know, they'll go soak. And um, so, yeah, I definitely saw that. Okay, but it was more like you get you got to know a lot of their personalities. It sounds like doing yeah. this work. Like, were there any particular turtles that that uh, were kind of that uh, I don't know grew on you? I guess. <laughs> oh yeah, um, I had a little female. Uh, one of my favorites because she didn't move very far from the pen and was always easy to find. Her name was uh, Mango. I did a little project where people, if they donated to our crowdfunding, they could name it. And someone named her Mango. Um, but uh, so she's one of my favorites. And then um, 
add another one. So whenever they were in the soft release bin for seven months, we would give them some supplemental food. <clears throat> and uh, and I had one turtle remember me as the lady that gave him food. So whenever um, I would go, so he was one of the ones that swim across the creek. And when I would track him, um, he would kind of perk up and just walk up to me because he always thought I had food. Um, so he grew on me because he was uh, always very much. Uh, I remember he tried to eat the zipper on my backpack because it was like bright red. So he was just, he just was very friendly, had such a personality. So um, yeah, that, that one was probably one of my favorites too. I think his name was Dooley. Someone named him Dooley. That's, uh, that's funny. They, they, they all have, that's something about the box turtles. It's, they all have sort of interesting personalities. Some turtles are not so uh, animated, but box turtles are, are like that. Oh, yeah. uh, it, it, so is anyone, so this is, it's interesting because you had two years of data. That's, that's a lot of data, but it would, it's, I mean, you assume that the home range kind of stays, if it's stable and sort of small, you figure it doesn't change much, but is anyone following up uh, with, with your work and continuing that? Or is that kind of, are, are you done? Is it that done for now? It's so my comp, my turtles were actually like released from the study. So we took the transmitters off. So they're now in the wild. So those aren't being followed up on. I think it, in the future for studies that want to do something like that, I think it'd be worth uh, leaving it like tracking them for longer. Like two years is a lot of data because there's no literature out there now. But um, I think, you know, they're a long lived reptile. So I think it's really important to get years of and years of data if, if you can. Um, so. Peter Pritchard actually had a Yucatan box turtle. That, oh, really? Uh, yeah, that was like, I think it's probably one of the older turtles I've seen in person uh, when I visited CRI for the first time. Because he's had, he had, according to him, he had that turtle since he was a child. And it was an adult when he acquired it. And wow. still kicking when we found it uh, at CRI. It was like missing the leg and everything. It was pretty gnarly cool. <laughs> they... That's amazing. Did, did you see a lot of older worn down turtles or what, what was the, uh, I mean, maybe just even the wild turtles that weren't part of the study that you came across just in the process of tracking them. Did you see a lot? Oh, for sure. There was a lot of older um, turtles. Um, I was told that um, when they're really smooth and you don't see any life that they're probably over 70 years old. Um, so we, I found a lot like that. So there's some really old individuals on base. Um, but yeah, it's definitely older. It was kind of, uh, rare for me anyway, when I was out there to find like younger individuals, I think we found one with like five years of growth one time. And that was like a big deal because mostly they're just really old individuals out there. Wow. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, that you'd expect maybe you'd see younger ones because that's not disturbed habitat, but um maybe they're just really good at hiding that's probably what it is yeah <laughs> ridiculously good at hiding i think very good's an understatement yeah <laughs> yep so okay so uh in terms of conclusions it seems like the translocated turtles uh it, so in the first year it, they were they had bigger ranges than wild turtles but then it kind of calmed down and it became not statistically different is that that's right yeah so it, it seems like that's promising that was that's a good thing um and that's one thing that's good to know is if they all start moving and they start just going all over the place then that's not good but it, they kind of calm down home range wide but then there's another aspect of i mean what drives th this is sort of a question about that like i i'm not sure anyone knows the answer to this but like when you introduce turtles, what's driving that longer distance dispersal? Because I doubt a confiscated turtle. What, what do you think is driving that longer dispersal that could theoretically happen that you didn't see, but it could theoretically happen? Um, you know, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, I, I understand that turtles have really good homing capabilities. So that could be part of it. Also, I know like um, you know, they're not familiar with that area. Um, so finding an area where they have all their resources also might play into it. So it's just searching for, 
where they want to establish their home range. That's kind of my thoughts on it. That makes sense. Just not, yeah, not familiar. And yeah, right. Uh, so the other aspect, though, is, OK, they, they can set up a range, but what like mortality rates, that's something that is also important because it's not necessarily linked to how well they do in the habitat in terms of movement. Uh, was there a difference in mortality between introduced turtles and, and wild native turtles or? Oh, yeah. So the confiscation, confiscated turtles, um, you know, they're found in really poor conditions. Um, I mean, when they were found, they were in like open containers in full sun without water. Um, they weren't sure how long they were there. And so, um, you know, we had a, about out of our transmitted animals that we put out there, we had in the first year, we had about a 60 to 67.5 percent survival rate. Um, there's a range because three turtles went missing, so you can't really say what happened to them. But um, and then residents, of course, we didn't lose any of them. That was 100 percent survival rate. Now, in the second year, when everyone had an established home range and kind of knew where they were at, um, it was a 95.8 percent to 100 percent survival rate. Um, there's a range there because uh, there was one box turtle that it's the one that woke up from dormancy and just moved a kilometer. Eventually, he was lost from the study. So basically, we almost had 100 percent survival rate um, the second year once they established themselves. Was there any correlation between the size of the home range in the first year and turtles that uh, that passed away? Yeah, so from what I can remember, um, turtles that, uh, so we looked a little bit into pathogens um, for my second chapter of my thesis, and uh, turtles that were like infected with a pathogen uh, weren't really, and, and it was certain pathogens weren't really going to move as much because they don't feel good. So those would probably have the smaller home range than a turtle that's strong, healthy, a good body condition that can look and look for resources until it finds a place it finds suitable. Um, so that's kind of the trend we were seeing there. That's interesting. So, okay, that, that was sort of not, I was thinking maybe, but that, that makes a lot more sense. I was thinking that when you, a lot of times in urban habitat, it seems like species will have bigger home range and that that's sort of correlated with poorer habitat. But that's not really what you were analyzing. It's more the health of the turtle itself. And so, mm -hmm. that, right, that would make sense. Healthier turtles are going to be able to move more and maybe have more of a developed homing sense. I mean, if they're sick, that homing sense may get messed up. So sure. that that could even be something. So that but that that's interesting that you found that. Uh, another thing too, that's sort of, that's unrelated to the range, but that's just interesting to me is, did you see much sexual dimorphism in the eye coloration? Yeah. So that was something, um, I think in my confiscated turtles, it was pretty easy to tell them apart. There were some where it was like the eye color didn't mean anything. Um, and the residents I found, there was a lot where, um, uh, females had bright eyes and, uh, I was reading, uh, so I was reading that eyes are not a good characteristic for sexual dimorphism, um, but I was reading uh, about pack cell volume, and um, if it's at a certain level, the the turtle's eye will like have more of a red color. So I think it depends on the health of the turtle, maybe, um, rather than what sex it is. But uh, so the eye was not uh, reliable, um, but you know the concave plastron. Uh, if it's round like a hockey puck, that's a female, you know. So that was really the characteristics we were looking at uh, when sexing them. So it could be – that. that's real interesting. That, that's an interesting take on it. I know there's been some uh, controversy about that, but if it's like an anemic turtle or something, mm -hmm. it's the, it could have just fewer circulating blood cells and less color. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. that could make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, so in terms of you were w walking around, I mean, I'm sure you clocked a lot of miles in there doing that. Uh, yeah. And you probably saw a lot more. Well, I mean, did you see box turtles interacting with other species? Uh, was that something you saw a lot of or? No, I mainly saw them, um, I guess, besides foraging, like eating snails and, and stuff like that. Uh, I mainly just saw them interacting with each other. 
Um, I did find a turtle um, really close, like a meter away from a timber rattlesnake. They weren't like interacting, but it was like right there. <laughs> so they probably saw each other. But other than that, um, there weren't any uh, interactions. I, I mean, besides like some of them in the beginning of the study, uh, they did get uh, um, like eaten by a raccoon. So that was one of the like interactions that didn't end well. <laughs> um, so that was more, uh, the good interactions were box turtle to box turtle, basically. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, we also, sort of unrelated to turtles, but did, did you see any other cool thing, animals or plants or anything while, while tracking them sort of as, uh, I, I like to call that bycatch whenever I'm doing turtle work. It's like, it, it's all cool stuff, but I'm there for the turtles. <laughs> um, yeah, so I got to see uh, quite a few timber rattlesnakes. Um, I almost stepped on one. You know, luckily I had muck boots on. I mean, it didn't do anything. It just kind of sat there and was like, what are you doing? Um, but I saw a lot of timbers um, out there, which are cane breaks, I guess, there, um, which are absolutely gorgeous. Um, uh, salamanders, too. Um, every once in a while, I might flip a log um, and just see what was under it. And uh, I found a few pretty red salamanders. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of what else I might have seen. Um, I, I've seen a few raccoons like climbing up trees because you're out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, I ran into a lot of hogs as well being out there. So, um, but yeah, probably the coolest things I found were the, the timber rattlesnakes because I, I, or the cane breaks. I really like them. That's cool. Yeah. Working in a really diverse area uh, that that's that they're, they're really pretty snakes. We, why was there, we saw one uh, in, in, not in South Carolina, but uh, probably more uh, uh, west of where you were working. But that was, I've only seen one. That, that was a really cool experience. Nice. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, in, in terms of uh, placing your conclusions in broader context, how, how do your results compare to other studies that have looked at box turtles or other turtles uh, in terms of home range and acclimation? Yeah, so basically earlier studies that kind of did what we did, they took uh, turtles and translocated them um, and they monitored them over a couple of years. They found, so, you know, we we saw the phenomenon of these home ranges getting smaller with time and being comparable to residents. Um, and they saw this too, but about 30, it was about 33 to 73% of their turtles uh, presented this phenomenon. While our study, we observed about a 95.8% uh, phenomenon of the home ranges becoming smaller and more comparable as the years went on. Um, so that was really encouraging um, to see that. I think some of what helped, because some of these studies were in like uh, land fragmented areas. So it wasn't uh, like, there's a lot of fragmentation, which isn't helpful because that, you know, exposes turtles to roads and stuff like that. We also uh, had really good quality habitat that we released our turtles into as well. So I think we had a lot uh, going for us uh, when we uh, when they picked the location for these turtles to be released into. Right, that 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 makes a lot of sense, and it kind of leads into the second question I have about this: is like, how, are are the implications from your study? It's it's interesting, but how universal should it be? Like. Does this apply to other chunks of land and, and for managers that are looking at uh, this is that'd be more of a tortoise sort of situation where you develop land and then relocate it. Uh, it. It almost seems like based on what you're finding, the dynamics of the habitat matters a lot in terms of the success of the translocation or in terms of the release confiscation release. Is that something that you think is true? For sure. I mean, there's a paper that says uh, a lot of uh, a majority of translocation failures occur because animals were released into poor quality habitat. So I think for um, for anyone, if you're interested in like uh, a property being uh, a place where turtles can be released, you want to make sure you have good um, unfragmented uh, habitat. I think that's really important. Yeah, that. That makes a lot of sense. It's something that seems obvious, but it's uh, it seems like 
The problem with it, I think, a lot of the times is the the fact that how it's managed. A lot, it, it's sort of it the where the the tortoises or turtles go is sort of out of the hands of the biologists, right? Or for the most part, so it becomes it's someone else doing the decision making and consulting with the biologist. But a lot of times, it doesn't seem like that that really actually factors into the decision. It's just where can we put these? Where do we have the space? Or is it feasible? Right. Yeah. So, okay. That that's, I mean, it's, it's really interesting work that you've done and that you saw compared to the other study that there was more of a, a, a shrinkage of the, the range in, in better habitat that that's promising. And hopefully for future plans to release confiscated turtles, there's land available that is not altered. Um, yeah, I think that's definitely a consideration because, you know, our study is kind of uh, we're hoping it serves as like guidelines or steps you can take, like what to do, what not to do. And we're hoping that, you know, that that's one of the suggestions we have is like, you know, where can you put them? Do you have uh, the area, you know, the good quality habitat, whatever, you know, to put them into? Right. Yeah, that that's I think it's important. It also speaks to the fact that that we've talked to folks in the past and and talking about what the uh, the worst issue for turtles is. And it seems like it's sort of a divided uh, question. Not a lot of people agree. Uh, I'm. What do you think that the that, that this one is just uh, like turtles in general? Um, it's like the habitat destruction seems like it's a very high ranking thing. And this seems like, uh, even though it's not what you analyzed, it's kind of the contrapositive to what you analyzed. And it proves that degraded habitat is not good. <laughs> and it just sort of the opposite, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. All right. So yeah, that that's cool. And uh, there's a lot of different implications from your work and that's, it's really cool stuff that, that you did. Um, so in sort of wrapping up here, um, just curious, cause you're still, uh, we've talked to a lot of people that are kind of at the end of their career, but you're still, you have plenty of time. So I, what, what future plans do you have it turtle work or, or, uh, are you not doing turtle work or what, what's the future look like? Yeah. So, um, right now with my job, I'm more of like a generalist which is good because you learn about everything. Um, but I would, in the future, I'd love to um, work more again with reptiles and amphibians just because, you know, they need a lot of help. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I love the work I did on Eglin. You know, I did a bunch of like habitat restoration for flatwood salamanders. And that was really cool because you could see your progress and you could see that you're making a change. And um, so really, I guess, uh, it's kind of uh, like general, but I, I would love to work again in like uh, with a focus in reptile and amphibian conservation and management. Um, I, I would love to work with turtles, but, you know, I'll work with with anything uh, if it's a, if it's a herp. <laughs> so. Cool, cool. That's that's exciting. Um, and then it, sort of the last question we like to ask is, uh, you have one piece of advice for someone that's looking to make turtle tortoise research uh, part of a career or a career or reptile research, that sort of thing. What, what would that be? Yeah. So um, I highly recommend experience. Um, this field is so competitive. And so, uh, you know, I'd recommend like, uh, you know, volunteering if you're in high school, you know, volunteer at your local zoo or wildlife management area because you can start acquiring skills and like gaining those connections. Um, and then, you know, if you're an undergrad, uh, try and get those summer internships. Uh, that's something that I didn't do. And uh, I struggled for about a year trying to get a job. I mean, I finally did and it worked out for me. But, you know, I didn't have a lot of experience coming out of undergrad, even though I did go on those field trips where, you know, I got skills and stuff. So, you know, go for summer internships, you know, volunteer, go on those optional field trips. Um, but yeah, just try and get experience as much as you can. Cause that's, uh, like I said, this field is incredibly competitive and that's, uh, you know, your GPA is important, um, but experience is uh, what's going to get you a job. Sweet. Um, before we wrap it up, I also wanted to kind of show this off. Uh, everybody I show who's like into box turtles finds this super cool. Uh, this is a box turtle shell I have. 
and you can see it has clear signs of scoliosis. Oh, no way. Yeah. I don't know. If wow. Could... That is so cool. Be like it. Yeah, look at that. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Dude. Yeah, it's like a curve in the spine. That is crazy. Oh, yeah. Textbook. So, yeah, I thought you'd find it. That's cool. Is it like an old turtle shell? Like, yep. can you see it's, how old it, it was? It's a relatively young one. I mean, there's still a lot of growth annuli. Um, okay. Not, I I can't tell how old the turtle is because the shell is pretty messed up on the carapace, too. There's oh. a lot of bumps and curves and all that. That had a lot of bad luck. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. I mean, when I found it, it was falling apart. I had to do a little bit of work on it. But, oh, yeah. nice. That's so cool. That's awesome. <laughs> What's the story on that? I don't think I've seen that one. Before. There's not really a huge story. I mean, I was out looking for box turtles, and it was after it had rained, so I figured it'd be the best time. And I guess uh, the wind must have blown away some leaf litter that was covering this because I saw it partially um, uncovered uh, on its back. So I figured a raccoon had gotten to it, most likely. Yeah. Um, but this turtle, I mean, and it's always astounded me. Um, one of my biggest things about turtles is their aversion to uh, mortal de deformities. Um, because at us, as terrestrial vertebrates, would be absolutely crippled by a scoliosis of that magnitude. But yeah. uh, uh, such a terrestrial admited, like a box turtle, um, I mean, I can see with... Uh, aquatic amides like uh, cooters um, or just aquatic turtles in general, the water can kind of alleviate the tension caused by um, spinal deformities or just deformities in general. But uh, a, a terrestrial turtle like this who had lived its entire life with, uh, <laughs> with something that would completely take us out of the game, uh, <laughs> lived probably a full life. Well, maybe not a full life, but um, it wasn't taken out due to its injury. It was most likely found while it was brumating and was – by yeah. Um, yeah, it's crazy how resilient they are. <laughs> it, it always struck me. It's one of my favorite things about turtles is how resilient they can be. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I found several like residents. Uh, one had like a clamped shell and it, its uh, leg was completely missing like at the joint and it was just, it was thriving. And it's just oh. crazy what they can survive. Yeah, yeah. The uh, One of my favorite spot, one of my favorite bo uh, bo box turtle spots in Delaware is right across the the, uh, the channel from a power plant. Uh, not really a power plant; it's more of a, like a tire factory, I think, is what it actually is. And back in back in the '80s, they used to dump chemicals into the channel, and I'm pretty sure it got into the soil, which got into the plants. Mm -hmm. Now all these box turtles there have these deformities, and I actually plan on checking it out and doing a, uh, a paper on it uh, with next year um because there's somebody with that i'm talking to with the united states geological department who's actually interested in working on me with that but um uh i'm fairly certain that all these tumors and deformations and i'm finding all these box turtles are from that but the box turtles are fine they don't care yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow. it's That's great that'll be interesting to to see yeah yeah it's Ooh. definitely something i've got my eye on nice that's cool I saw a photo recently floating around of, I think it was a uh, desert box turtle or ornate box turtle that it looked like, I mean, half of the shell on the, the side of the shell was completely fragmented and it had healed in like the scutes had fully fixed in on both sides. Mm -hmm. And it just, had, it looks like a, a bite, a chunk was just taken out of it. <laughs> and it's wow. fine. Yeah. yeah it's crazy. And and most box turtles that I find have their marginals completely shredded from predation attempts. And it, well, two marks. Yeah, yeah. Nibble <laughs> like marks from raccoons and foxes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy how they just can take that with in stride. Yeah, it, yeah, they're resilient. <laughs> yeah, very. Yeah, this, they're yeah really resilient animals. Really, it, turtles in general. Uh, we also at the end, so uh, we like to do a little. I, for, I I keep forgetting to tell people this, but oh, we, I got like go. Okay, we we like to do a little turtle trivia at the end, uh, okay. just for fun, and it, it's uh, we can do it however you want to do it. Um, if you want, if you just want to ask us some questions, Emma, uh, that that works for us. If you've got a few, it's always I always catch people off guard. I try to tell them 
in my initial when I reach out and everything, but I always forget. I don't know if you've got a few random turtle facts. that. You yeah, it's like a to. game pretty much. We take a little bit of time, come up with some questions, and we quiz each other at the end, of, essentially. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to lie. I listened to a podcast where y'all did this, so I was prepared. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, okay, one uh, – well, y'all have the book on uh, – by Dodd, so you probably know it, but we'll see. So, name the extinct subspecies of box turtle that resided in Georgia. Hootenamai. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> there you go. All right. Is that your one, or you got any? You got any others? Um, I guess. Well, you're from Delaware, right? So you yeah. probably know. I was going to ask, what is the most like well-known plant? that box turtles are known to like be seed dispersers for? Oh man, I don't know. I don't know that one. Oh, okay. I, I think I may know this. Is it May apple? Yes. <laughs> hey, okay, cool. Yeah. Two for two. Nice. yeah, they obviously, I mean, they probably are, I've heard that they're probably really good with mushrooms and dispersing those as well, but I know they're like really well known for the May apple. I think we have May apples in Delaware. Wow. No, never mind then. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I really, or at least I've never seen one. I wouldn't okay. describe it in existence, but I've never seen one. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how I know that. I, I think it was just from reading uh, the Dodd book. It's just I yeah. saw the word enough <laughs> that it was just, yeah. All right, that's good. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, we, we, why you said you had a good question. I don't know if you want to take any questions. I just, <laughs> no, I got a good, I got a good little, uh, uh, little, um whatever um all how right many, well, yeah. how many species including subspecies of box turtles are there on the north american continent oh yeah that's a counting question yeah uh, um I, God, is it five no <laughs> oh, oh you want no. that okay so it's also did you count uh We'll double team this one because I can't I can't count right now. Uh, did you count um, the Quahelan box turtle? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, All the yeah. Ex extant yeah. family terrapine is. I mean, the genus terrapine is fair game here. Dang. So, okay. One thing I would say too. Uh, I've heard at least that. Well, it, it seems like all of the subspecies of eastern box turtles will be elevated at mm. some point so we could just consider them species uh so and there's nelson i so spotted box turtle quahelan box turtle uh there's the clobber eye too that's a subspecies of a spotted so that's oh god i totally misunderstood the question i thought you just meant box turtles yeah, yeah. Yeah, every I'm talking about every every species and subspe subspecies native to the genus terrapine. Oh, I have no clue. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I should have led with. <laughs> All right, three toed Gulf Coast, Florida Eastern, uh, ornate. Yeah, ornate desert. desert. There's got to be what else am I missing? Huh? There's something else. Uh, Am I missing something? I think we let, did we let, is it nine? It's the answer is 11. 11. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Too off. Thanks, thanks, Carl J. Franklin, with for your very, uh, shout out to Carl J. Franklin. What are the two others that we missed? So there is, um, there is the Florida box turtle, the three toed box turtle. I don't think you said that. Uh, the Mexican I I box did. Turtle, Eastern box turtle, Gulf Mexican Coast, box turtle, Yucatan, Yucatan and Mexican. Those are the two. Yeah. <laughs> Western, Quahulian, Northern spotted, and Southern spotted. Wow. I didn't know that right. myself. I had to. I had to check in with the book. So <laughs> you, guys, you guys gave it a good run. Oh. <laughs> that was a valid. That was a good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, that's. Uh, uh, unless you've got anything else you want to add, Emma, we can uh, sort of wrap up. Thanks for coming on. That was a, a fun discussion. It was cool to hear about all of the work that you're doing and 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 sort of the implications of your thesis and more about the like 
talking about the results is one thing, but then hearing about all the, the personalities of the turtles and the little things you don't put in the paper is cool too. So thanks for, yeah. thanks for coming on. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. And I'd like to add, like, we're trying to publish this data and we want it to be open access, but obviously that costs money. And we have a crowdfunding page related to UGA SREL. Um, so anyway, people can donate if they want to see this and ha everyone can have open access. So anyone can have guidelines, um, you know, to deal with confiscations. Hmm. Cool. We'll, we'll link it in the uh, description of the, the episode. That'd be uh, great. Thank you. <laughs> what's the, what is the, the title of it? Just so people know. Uh, I think it's, uh, I think the title is uh, Bulldogs for Box Turtles. Yeah. Okay. I've seen that. Yeah. That, that, yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll put a link to that. So anyone listening, just go to the link in the, whatever you're listening on and uh, you can access that and donate because it's cool stuff. And I, I actually was kind of, uh, I was kind of bummed because usually I like to read all the papers, but there's, I think there's an embargo on the, the on the thesis. So it's not, it's not published yeah. yet. So yeah. if you're not going to, if you don't, if you're not doing it for yourself, do it for me. And I'm assuming Wyatt <laughs> too, and all of us. So yes. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for coming on. That was fun. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. All right. This is uh Colonia cast episode 40. We'll see you on the next one.